an interesting Advent suggestion as to what to do each of the 24 days of Advent leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas. This has gained some traction the last few years in social media. The book of Luke, which we just finished preaching through, has 24 chapters. Read one chapter a day. One chapter a day of Luke. And when Christmas Day comes, you will have been prepared. Today we're going on to Hosea. It was not unusual for God to ask his prophets to do something as a visual lesson. For example, he told Isaiah, the prophet, to strip off his clothes and walk around naked. Then he instructed Jeremiah, the prophet, to hide his underwear under a rock and to, after a long time, go back and retrieve it. Later, he instructed Ezekiel to eat and digest a scroll that he had written on as part of his prophetic calling. Of course, those things all had explanations and points to them, but what God asked of the prophet Hosea had to be the most unusual command ever issued in the Bible, and we will find out what that was in just a moment. In the Old Testament, there are written books of 16 prophets. Four of them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, are known as the major prophets. Major, not because their books are more important than those of the 12 minor prophets, but major in the sense that their books are much longer than those of the minor prophets. Hosea is thus known as a minor prophet. But his story is anything but minor. Author James Boyce calls Hosea's story the second greatest story in the Bible, next to the story of our Savior, because both stories point to God's pardoning, grace, forgiveness, and love. Hosea was a prophet in the land of Israel in the 8th century BC. During the reigns of Uzziah, these are different kings, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. And during the reign of Jeroboam II, son of Jehoash, who was the king of Israel. I'll explain all this. In the southern kingdom of Judah, King Uzziah reigned from 783 BC for 40 years, King Jotham for 40 years, or for seven years from 742 BC, King Ahaz from 735 BC for 20 years, and King Hezekiah from 716 BC for the rest of the century. The prophet Hosea lived through all of those kings of Judah. He was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. But whereas Isaiah's message was to the people of Judah, whose kings we just mentioned, Hosea's message was to the people of the northern kingdom of Israel, primarily during the reign of King Jeroboam II, 786 to 746 BC, but then beyond that as well. So Hosea ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel, 760 to 715 BC. Hosea's name means God's salvation, but many people refer to him as a prophet of doom. Though his prophecies were intended to turn the people away from their sins and to restore Israel to their rightful place with the Lord. For about 40 years, Hosea thus warned the people of Israel that their sinful rebellion against God would bring impending doom and judgment, the consequences of their rejection of God and his will. Now, 300 years prior, the 12 tribes of Israelites made up the unified kingdom of Israel during the reigns of kings Saul, David, and Solomon. However, following Solomon's reign, the unified kingdom of Israel divided into two nations. Israel in the north, with the city of Samaria as its capital, and Judah in the south, with Jerusalem as its capital. The two southernmost tribes of Judah and Benjamin combined to make up the nation of Judah, from which we get the word Jews. 
The northern kingdom of Israel was composed of the other 10 tribes. As previously mentioned, Hosea started sharing prophecies of warning from God around 760 BC to those northern nations. But we read in 1 Chronicles 5.26 about those northern nations that the God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul, king of Assyria, and he took into exile the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. They were the ones who lived on the east side of the Jordan River. That was in 740 BC. So Hosea the prophet was grieved. He'd been warning them for 20 years already that if they did not repent and change, doom was going to come to them. He was grieved because the people had not listened to his warnings. And so the people on the eastern side of the Jordan River were taken away, the Reubenites, Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Hosea kept on warning the remaining seven northern tribes, those on the west side of the Jordan River. But nearly 20 years later, in 722 BC, following a three-year siege of the city, we read in 2 Kings 17, that in the ninth year of King Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria. So it was 40 years of waste, if you want to be harsh about it. 40 years of wasted effort by God and Hosea the prophet. All through this time, Hosea had been prophesying, and he kept on doing so for at least another five years. But after Israel had been taken away totally, those last five years, he was warning the people of the southern kingdom of Judah, warning them to not be like their northern relatives in Israel, whose rejection of God had led to them being taken away into exile. The Lord had warned Israel of judgment, with Hosea simply being the last of the prophets to them. But that northern kingdom of Israel had strayed from a true worship of God. The people committed themselves to a type of spiritual prostitution in which they mixed their own desires into worship of idols on their temple, in their temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And you'll remember in John chapter 4 of Jesus meeting with the woman at the well in Samaria, and she talked about how we worship God on our own mountain, Mount Gerizim here in Samaria. But it wasn't that the worship of God was true, because the place they turn into a kind of fertility rite station. And so it was a place complete with temple prostitutes who were there to perform fertility rites. And so the men would meet with them, have sex in the hopes of fertility. And in order to make a powerful statement of what it was like for him to be in relationship with them, an idolatrous, shameful people who went after prostitutes, God ordered his prophet Hosea to marry a prostitute, a prostitute named Gomer. Now we've heard about what God had Isaiah do, walk around naked, Jeremiah hide his underwear, Ezekiel eat and digest a scroll. But this was the most shameful thing he ever asked of anyone, to go and marry a prostitute. Now the actual Hebrew word is ahur. The NIV that we use is much gentler than that. And so we see that Gomer was Hosea's wife. And in the NIV, she is described as a promiscuous woman. The Hebrew word is hur. Her name means complete. So completely had the people given themselves to whoring after other gods that God ordered his spokesperson Hosea to marry a lady who is completely promiscuous. Now think about this. The idea of marrying an impure woman was hardly the match Hosea's parents envisioned for their son. This was not the kind of wife they would have been praying for. A son's marriage would normally be an arranged affair, but as it turned out, Hosea's parents had no say in the matter. 
for marrying Gomer was what God told Hosea to do. The prophet could have easily, with grounds, later divorced his wife. He could have ended the marriage and walked away, just as God could have justified walking away from the sinful Israelites. But God would not allow Hosea that easy way out. Hosea was told to stay in the marriage and work through the pain of marital rejection and betrayal. To bring the enormity of the people's shame and of his great love for his people to the forefront, God told Hosea that he and Gomer would have children with names of shame and of hope. Their three children all were given names with symbolic meanings, reflecting the relationship between God and Israel. Now, these were not polite names in the least. First, there was a son, Jezreel, whose name means judgment. And imagine Hosea saying to him, judgment, tidy up your room. A daughter, lo Ruhamah, whose name means no more mercy. No more mercy, come for dinner. Another son, Lo Amai, whose name means not my people. Not my people, are you ready for school? As evangelist Ravi Zacharias points out, every time Hosea or Gomer called their kids, called out their names, it was a reminder of what God was about to do to the nation of Israel. Judgment was coming. No more mercy would be shown to them. The Israelites would not be my people anymore, declared God. Karen is going to be reading for us from Hosea chapter 1. And so we read from Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, son of Beeri, during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, and during the reign of Jeroboam, son of Joash, king of Israel. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go, marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. So he married Gomer, daughter of Dibliam, and she conceived and bore him a son. As we go through this book in these next four sermons, what we will find is that Hosea is called by God to point out three glaring sins in the nation of Israel. First, they had prostituted themselves with foreign gods. They had left the one true God, the God who had chosen them and looked after them. Second, they had done so because they were without knowledge of God, because their own religious leaders had not been teaching the people about God. Thus, the religious leaders were the ones most to blame. The result of the people leaving God and worshiping foreign gods and the religious leaders not teaching them about God was that third, the people of Israel were ignorant about the laws of God and God himself. They were sinning, true, but they were ignorant. However, they were also willfully ignorant and dismissive of God and his ways. They chased away the prophets. This was proven by their despising of the prophetical messages God sent to them. Now the key to understanding the overall message of Hosea, Hosea is an illustration put forth in the verses Karen has just read for us. In this illustration of his prophet going and marrying a prostitute, Hosea represents a loving God. And Gomer represents a rebellious and sinful nation of Israel. But here's the thing we will read. Gomer, even after she was married to Hosea, and even after she had three children with him, kept on returning to her prostituting ways. She kept on going back. Wife and mother Gomer continued in her infidelity to the marriage with Hosea. And we will see how that brought Hosea such shame having to go and sit with the other men waiting for his wife. We'll see that in the chapters to come. She continued in her infidelity to her marriage and in her shaming of her three children. Her willful defiance and continual sin were surely a picture of how the people of Israel were treating God with indifference and contempt. The situation God created with Hosea and his wife Gomer 
was what was happening spiritually with Israel and God. Israel had prostituted itself with other gods. Now to their children, about their first son we read. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call him Jezreel, because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. In that day I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. The name Jezreel came from the valley of Jezreel, which was the place where a former king of Israel, Jehu, had slaughtered the family of the evil king Ahab and his infamously evil wife of all evil wives, Queen Jezebel. The name Jezreel, rejected, has significance to the people of Israel, for it carried with it a sense of woe and dread. As Jezreel was where Jehu went overboard in massacring an entire family, many of them innocent. God was telling the people of Israel that through Hosea's son Jezreel, that just as Ahab's family came to an end in Jezreel, the valley of Jezreel, that this child would be a reminder to the nation that God was going to end their nation unless they repented and turned to him. You have been disobedient and have prostituted yourself and you will come to an end judgment. Jezreel is coming. Gomer conceived again and gave birth to a daughter. Then the Lord said to Hosea, Call her Lo Ruhamah, which means no more mercy, for I will no longer show love to Israel, that I should forgive, that I should at all forgive them. Yet I will show love to Judah, and I will save them, not by bow or sword or battle, but by horses and horsemen. But I, the Lord, their God, will save them. Here the judgment of God is being compared to the northern nation of Israel, which would not repent. Being compared, they, with the southern kingdom of Judah, which would repent. And we know that is what happened. The people in the two southern tribes, Benjamin and Judah, did repent. They listened to Hosea. Hosea. And so when Assyria came to destroy Israel in 722 B.C. and then tried to attack Judah, they were unsuccessful in doing so. And the nation of Judah survived. As for the people of Israel, though, their refusal to repent left God no choice but to discipline them. They had gone one step too far. And in his discipline, God was going to show no more mercy. They had had his mercy for hundreds of years beforehand, and their time was up. Their daughter's name should have been a wake-up call for the people, but it wasn't. The nation of Israel refused to wake up to repent. The Jewish people were thus being divided between those who believed in God's actions, the people of Judah, as well as the prophets in Israel, and those who believed God was not in control. You can't be serious. Two children, two terrible prophecies for the northern kingdom. Then, after she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, Gomer had another son. Then the Lord said, Call him Lo Amai, which means not my people. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. To these people who refused to bow to him and to give him sovereignty, God said, you will no longer be my people. I will no longer be your God. Three children. You've got Jezreel, Lo Ruhamah, and Lo Amai. Jezreel meaning judgment, Lo Ruhamah, with Ruhamah being the Hebrew word for mercy, and Lo being the negative in Hebrew, so no mercy, thus no more mercy. And lo amai, amai being the word for people, and thus lo amai, the negative, not my people. Judgment, no more mercy, no more mercy, not my people. Who would ever think of giving their children such names? God did. Turning now to verses 9 and 10, we find traces of hope, however, a message which will be explored more fully in the chapters to come. A hope which we, the followers of God's Messiah, Jesus, know started to be fully played out in him at the time of his wonderful birth, which he, we celebrate during Advent and Christmas. 
Nevertheless, we read <coughs> in these final verses of chapter 1, a message of faint hope for a nation that needs to repent. God's promise of grace is present in these verses, as you will hear. God is saying, yes, I'm going to discipline, but discipline you, but you will not pass away as a people forever. You are going to prosper. And where I have called you not my people, I am going to call you my people once again. Yet the Israelites will be like the sand on the seashore, which cannot be measured or counted. In the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, they will be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel will come together, and they will appoint one leader and will come out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. Here God instills hope in the lives of those in Israel, hope that there would come a time when they would abandon idol worship and return to worshiping the one true God, who though he allowed them to experience judgment, and Assyrian judgment was like nobody else's, they're the harshest people on earth. When he allowed them to feel the sting of no more mercy from him, of not being his people, still we have hope here that he would never fully leave them or abandon them. The message for us that I'm going to conclude with today is one of promise and warning. Our actions have consequences, both good and bad. We read that throughout Scripture. When we do good, the consequences are good. When we do bad, the consequences are bad. So let us return to God. We will hear that theme later in Hosea. As Christians, we know that we, he will never leave us nor forsake us as the promise of Jesus, the one whose birth we celebrate. God's profound love for each of us is far easier to see in the New Testament because of what Jesus Christ has done for us and what we celebrate. But we can also see over and over and over again in the Old Testament that profound love that God had and has for his people. The Israelites in the latter half of the 8th century BC had become a people devoted to idols and to spiritual prostitution. They had gone hurrying after idols, false gods, who no doubt gave them momentary satisfaction, but they had lost their souls and were in for a world of hurt and destruction. Friends, we can make this life bad for ourselves if we deliberately snub our noses at God by committing ourselves to whatever sinful pleasures we want, but we can also make our life so good as we commit ourselves to serving and worshiping the one true God. Let us choose wisely as to how to live. To be continued next week, let's pray. Gracious Lord, this powerful book of Hosea a book of unfaithfulness and rejection, but yet of restoration and hope. And on this first Sunday of Advent in which we focus on hope, we thank you that you left them with that final message, that even though their world was falling apart, they could still have hope in you. Let us, Lord, dedicate ourselves afresh as your people to living for you, that we would experience your blessings and your hope. And so, Lord, we dedicate ourselves to doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's stand and sing good Christian.